Welcome to Forming the Spirit Within, a teaching ministry of Pastor Brad Riley. Pastor Brad is an associate and teaching pastor at First Church of the Nazarene here in Wichita, Kansas. He is the founder and director of the Merciful Servants of Christ, as well as the author of numerous articles. And now, here's Pastor Brad. Well, welcome to John chapter 17, probably one of my most favorite chapters in all of the Bible. This chapter is uh, the longest recorded prayer of Jesus. Uh, It is a beautiful, beautiful prayer. I've written on the board for you some things that uh, the prayer contains, some elements to the prayer. Uh, There are essentially five parts to the prayer, and we're going to take this study of John chapter 17 in probably all five of those parts so that we won't just go through the whole thing in one day, one week. Uh, But it's known as Jesus' high priestly prayer. We'll talk a little bit about why it's called a priestly prayer and what that means as well. Um, I do want to invite you to uh, take out your prayer cards, and let's begin this morning before we study with our prayer before the study of Scripture. And uh, we we are marching on through John. It's it's really getting down to the latter parts now, and there's so much here. Let's ask the Lord to bless us and help us as we understudy, as we study and try and understand. Let's pray. Illumine our hearts, O Master, lover of all humanity, with the pure light of your divine knowledge. Open the eyes of our hearts that we may understand your gospel teachings. Implant deep within us the fear of your blessed commandments that through them we may conquer all carnal desires and be transformed to live both thinking and doing the things that are pleasing to you. For you, O Lord, are the light of our souls and bodies, and unto you we give all glory and praise, together with our Father, who is from everlasting, and the all-holy, good, and life-creating Spirit, now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. I want to read John 17. I want to just read the whole prayer this morning. As I say, we'll study it in part. But let's feel and hear the whole prayer together at once. I'm going to read it to you from the New King James Version, which is not the version I break apart in study, but I like the way it flows for this prayer. And uh, I want to uh, just let you hear it. Let it fall on your ears. This morning, in its entirety, all at one setting. John chapter 17, verse 1. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself and with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given them, I have given to them the words which you have given me. And they have received them and have known surely that I came forth from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I no longer, now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you have, those whom you give me, 
sorry, let me start that again. Those whom you gave me, I have kept. And none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given them that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me. For you have loved me before the foundation of the world, O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you. And these have known you that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name, and I will declare it, that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. And with that, John chapter 17 closes. The whole chapter encompasses this beautiful prayer of Jesus Why do we call this a priestly prayer? There are elements to this prayer that we can identify. I've written them on the board. There are four different elements. A priest, if we can get that into our head, what what is the role of a priest? Who is a priest? What does a priest do? What's that? Teach. Teach and lead. Okay. Okay. Teach, lead. Any other thoughts come to your mind of what a priest does? In our common, in our common language, in our common uh, vernacular of the, the 21st century, especially as evangelical Christians, we're not used to thinking of the priesthood of priests. Uh, but in truth, every Everyone is a priest. I'm going to tell you that every one of you is a priest. Jesus uh, called for himself these particular men, these 12, if you will. Now we're down to 11, and we know later there's more added in, like Matthias and the Apostle Paul. But Jesus called them to himself, and he made them priests. We know that Peter, one of these great priests, considered the leader of the apostles. We know that Peter later writes in his uh, letter, uh, one of his letters, he writes about the royal priesthood of all believers. That's you and I. That's you specifically, me in a different role, but all of us. So in reality, you see everyone is a priest. So what are the common elements of the priesthood that make us all priests? Well, one common element is that we is that a priest offers sacrifice. Now, this is a prayer, so the declaration of the offering, number four here, the declaration of the offering, meaning the offering or the sacrifice, that in the prayer it's priestly because it declares that something is being sacrificed on behalf of someone to someone. Okay? Now, there's lots of religions that have priests, not just Christians. But in understanding who the priest is in this and our model after Jesus, I I think it's important for us to understand that the Christian called out ordained ministry, okay, what we call our pastors, okay, a clergyman is an old, kind of an old title, 
men of the cloth, in some cases women of the cloth, uh, those that are set apart to this particular office, if you will. In one sense, we are all priests as well. Dr. Jerry Porter, in one of his, general superintendent of the church, one of his, one of his ordination um, talks or sermons on ordination night of an assembly, I remember him preaching about the threefold office of the pastor, we, what we commonly call the pastor. The threefold office was this. The prophet, who is, in other words, to prophesy in, in, in biblical terms, to prophesy meant to speak for God, not to predict future events. The real edification of that word is to speak for God. Okay, And so we are called to be prophets. We're called to speak for God. He said we're called to be pastors. And what does the word pastor technically mean? What does the role of a pastor technically mean? A pastor is a word for shepherd. Okay? So the pastor is one who shepherds sheep or cares for them, leads them along, if you will, makes sure they have safe pasture and feeds them. So there's the prophet, the pastor, and third of all, he said the priest. Why why are we considered priests? Because we are offering ourselves as a go-between, if you will, between you and God. We are trying to lead our sheep to God. Okay, And the offering is our calling, our life, our ministry, our vow, if you will, um, to take the, the, the ministry full-time upon us, that mantle, to preach the word in season and out of season, as it says in in Paul's letter to Timothy. So that threefold office, that pastor, priest, we, we just tend to think of the whole thing as pastoral, but it's not. It's, it's more than that. When we, when we gather together for worship and the pastor, if you will, gets up to lead the congregation, he's fulfilling a priestly role. When the pastor gets up to pray over a sacrament, whether that Lord's Supper, he's fulfilling a priestly role. In, a, in the office of the Christian pastor, okay, the Christian priest or the Christian prophet, the sacrifice to God is what? We know that in the Old Testament, the sacrifice to God was, of the priest, the sacrifice to God was lambs, livestock, grain offerings, Incense offerings. You get see where that the priest was the one who was who was called and equipped and taught and ordained to do those roles. Okay, to do those ministry functions at the temple in Old Testament religion. But in the New Testament faith of Jesus Christ, there's still a priesthood, but it's a different priesthood. The old priesthood was the Le- Levitical priesthood. The Levites were a tribe of those called and separated for the priesthood of God, if you will, in the Old Testament, under the law of Moses. But in the New Testament, we are serving as according to a new priesthood. And you find the idea that Melchizedek was this priest who showed up to meet Abraham out on the plains outside of Salem, Salem, which is later to be called Jerusalem, Salem means peace. He was the, identified, Melchizedek was identified as the king of Salem, or the king of peace. Okay? And he offered, before Abraham there, he offered up, meeting Abraham, offerings of, does anybody remember? Bread and wine. This is the book of Genesis. Bread and wine. Isn't that interesting that that's what we use in our Holy Communion, bread and wine? Okay? And here it is in the book of Genesis in the very beginning. And it said that Melchizedek was of one without any origin. He's a kind of a mystical figure. Doesn't appear to have any origin or lineage of mankind. Mother or father. And it's the only time he's heard of in that offering when he meets Abraham and shares this offering as, a, as an offering of sacrifice of bread and wine to God Almighty.
Now, if you go all the way to the book of Hebrews, the Hebrew writer talks about this. He talks about Jesus Christ, who is now our high priest. Christians knew that from the time of the cross and the resurrection, Jesus had become an ascension. I need to include that because he goes into glory. Jesus has become our high priest at the right hand of God. We no longer need a Levitical priest, but we still need a priest, and it's Jesus Christ is our high priest. And so all the priests who would serve under him, or the ministers, if you will, of the covenant, who would serve under him would be priests of his. He is, it says in the book of Hebrews, Christ is our high priest of the order of Melchizedek. That's in the book of Hebrews. He's the writer of Hebrews, who many people believe is actually St. Paul, though we can't prove that, um, is, is going to great lengths to show that Jesus Christ as our high priest is not the same as the Old Testament priest, and neither is his ministry the same. And way back in the book of Psalms, we find in, in I believe in Psalm 51, that penitential psalm, we find that, in, and in several places it says this, actually, in different psalms, it says that the sacrifices of God, that God really desires, are not the blood of bulls and goats, but the, but the sacrifice of what? Of a contrite heart. What does contrite mean? Sorrowful, sorry, you're, you're truly penitent, of a penitent heart, a repentant, spirit of repentance. That's the sacrifice of God. And so a true contrite heart is lifted up, as the book of Psalms say, in sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving. So did you realize that when you come to worship every Lord's Day, every Sunday, every Lord's Day, when you come to worship and you sing praises of God, what you are doing, what you should be doing, if you're recognizing it in your heart, is you are offering, a, you are a priest of the royal priesthood of God, and you are offering a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to God Almighty. That's what you're doing. You're not there to just <coughs> sing a song. You're not just participating in a group experiment. <laughs> So what we're seeing here, when, when we begin to see this priestly office of Jesus Christ and how it is ministered by our churches and the leaders of our churches, the ordained, set-apart leaders of our churches, we begin to see uh, this connection to the old covenant, how it's fulfilled. The old one was incomplete. Because the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin forever. But the blood of Jesus that is about to happen on the cross. In John 17, and Jesus fully knows he's about to go to the cross. He's talking about the glory that he is bringing to the Father. And he knows that he's making a once and for all sacrifice, which will be good for every sin ever committed or ever would be committed. Now, so I wanted to give you that background on this idea of priest versus priest. Old Testament priest, New Testament priest. Uh, the word priest, the, the most commonly used term in the New Testament for people in my role, ordained ministers, the most common term is the word presbyter. You all heard of the Presbyterian Church? Sure you have. They, they borrowed that term from that word, presbyter. And that word is a Greek word, presbyteros. Presbyteros in Greek. And do you know what it, in English we would say presbyter? Do you know what that word translates to in its Greek? What the meaning was whenever you saw it? If you were reading the Greek New Testament, it talked about the presbyters. It literally translates to elder. The elders of the church were set aside. We know that Paul went to people like Timothy and, and he laid hands on them, it says, and they ordained them. So there is this idea of of setting apart and this transference of, of, of uh, the gifts of the Spirit in this ministry, in this office, by the laying on of hands that we see happening in the New Testament to this priesthood. Yes? What was the Greek term for presbyter? It's called presbyteros. Let me write it here for you. P-R-E-S-B-U-T-E-R-O-S. That's the English equivalency of the transliteration, presbyteros. Now, if you follow language, the etymology of words, 
and how they develop over the ages, you don't have to go too far. Once you get to English, the word becomes I think my etymology is right on this. I could be wrong, but I, I studied this years ago. The word becomes, uh, in some of the very old English, preost. That's starting to sound a lot like priest, isn't it? <laughs> so it doesn't take you too far to go to get the word priest. Okay. So the elders of the new covenant, if you will, the set-apart ordained elders of the new covenant are priests. So... Sometimes as evangelical Christians, we haven't done our historical and, and study and lessons and we don't understand that. Because when we look at another church, maybe a Lutheran church or an Episcopal church or certainly a Catholic church, and we see them who they call their ministers priests all the time, okay, then we think of a real difference between them and us because they're doing something. Well, they are offering sacrifices of a different nature in, in a sense, but the reality are they're also pastors, because they're shepherding. So we all, they also have to give sermons. They also have to teach. They have to lead their flock. So there's this threefold role that is encompassing all Christian ministry. And I want you to hear that it actually flows to you also. It's going to be real important by the time we get to the end of John 17 in a few weeks. I will never forget the day that, you know, there's certain days people say things to you just sticks in your head. And you never forget them. And, you know, as a young uh, teenager, I was struggling with a call to ministry, which would in the Catholic Church, of which I was Roman Catholic, was a call to, that meant a call to the priesthood. Well, in the priesthood of the Roman Catholic Church, you can't get married. It's a celibate life. For right or wrong, that's what they believe. And I struggled with that. I, I had this yearning to be in ministry, but yet couldn't wrestle with the thought of never having uh, that kind of family. And I'll never forget the pastor of that church, Monsignor Lampe, at the time, said to me, he said, Brad, I guess you're not called. And I heard those words again later as I, from the bishop's office when I was meeting with Father Alderman, who was the chancellor of the diocese at that time here. Well, I guess you're not called. But then but, but Mon Monsignor Lampe said something else to me that never left me. He said, but Brad, remember, you are a priest. You're the priest of your own family. Now, I wasn't married yet, but he knew that that was my desire. He said, you are going to be the priest of your own family. I, I didn't understand quite what he meant back then. Okay, I just thought, well, that's kind of profound. But now at the age of 58, I really understand what he meant. And, and you, even you women. You're the priest of your own family. In some cases, you're the last one left because your husbands are gone, you know, and, and gone to glory. And the truth is, you have lived a life of interceding for your... So we're going to talk about the elements. What are the elements of your, your prayer life for your family as you, your priesthood? The elements are you, you, uh, the glorif to glorify. The first one is that every priestly prayer begins with glory, giving glory to God. And look at what Jesus does here. He says, when Jesus spoke in these words, he lifted up his eyes, which in the Jewish culture of prayer meant he lifted his hands also. Okay? Lift up. That's how they prayed. Jews didn't pray like this. They prayed like this. Okay? So he lifted up his eyes and his hands to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy son, which is for himself. He's speaking of himself in the third person here. That the son may glorify thee. Glory always begins with glory. When Jesus taught his disciples to pray, didn't he teach us to begin with glory? Our Father who art in heaven. What? How would be thy name? Glory to your name. In other words, your name is holy. Give glory to God. Always begins with glory. And then there is this idea of the remembrance. And we're going to look at some verses that show that. There's the calling to mind the remembrance of God's work. There is the idea of intercession, that you're praying on behalf of someone. You all pray for your families. You pray for your children. You're interceding. You're being a priest to intercede to God on their behalf. And there is the idea of your, you, the, the, in your prayer somewhere, there is this idea that you're declaring what the offering is. And in Jesus' case, it's the cross. And he's declaring that to 
in this prayer, and we'll see that as we break it apart. So I wanted to give you, why is this called a high priestly prayer? Because Jesus is here functioning in this prayerful priestly office where he is praying on behalf of everyone. He's giving glory to God, remembering God's great work, and giving interceding for others and declaring that he's making an offering here, a self-sacrifice. Now, there are five parts to this chapter, and I've listed them on the board. In We'll just cover number one here today. Okay, In the first five verses of this prayer, Jesus, we see beautiful humility, and we see the idea of giving glory. So humble glory is kind of the first five, the theme of the first five verses, okay? And then next week we'll transition to talk about his prayer for the safety and what that means for the safety of those he's praying for. But let's let's kind of focus in today on these first five verses. We have a little background now on the priesthood of Jesus and the priesthood of all believers. And so let's focus in on what Jesus is doing as our high priest here. Why does Jesus pray for himself in the third person? Did anybody wonder that? Did you catch that? He doesn't say, Father, the hour has come. Glorify me that I may glorify you. That would be praying in the first person, right? He's praying in the third person. Father, glorify your son. Father, glorify your son that I may glorify thee. Is there a purpose to that third person prayer? There is, isn't there? There's a very important purpose. Remember that everything Jesus does, he's always teaching. He's always teaching. And remember how I told you that John's gospel is always teaching us about the mystery of the Trinity, the mystery of the Godhead. And it's very important. Jesus identifies himself in this prayer. We hear from his own lips him identifying himself as God's son. Okay, And we're going to see in a little bit a little further on down, how he identifies that unity of the Godhead, okay, that Trinitarian concept. But right now, it's important that he's identifying himself as God's son. That made an impact. It made a huge impact on John. He's remembering it to write it down that way all these years later when he wrote this gospel. Uh, so what does he mean by the hour has come? He opens his prayer with, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy son. That thy son may glorify thee. He's about to be crucified. He's about to be crucified. The hour, remember several times earlier in the Gospel of John, Jesus would use the phrase, my hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. But now the hour has come. And I think it's important for us to note that Jesus, who's controlling the hour? Jesus says, it's time. Jesus has full control. He will, in a matter of hours, lay down his life on a cross. As he says, no man takes it from me. I lay it down. Those are his own words. He, he's control, he's, he has all control of time. Jesus knew when it was time and when it wasn't. It wasn't this haphazard, well, we've done a lot. I guess it's time. Well, there's nothing, you know, like, things are pretty bad here in Jerusalem. It's kind of fever pitch level. The people are yelling like a mob. Maybe maybe now's the time. No, no, no. Jesus knew before all eternity when it would be time. Just like he does for you and I. You know, there's a little verse in the book of Psalms that nobody reads very often. It's Psalm 139.16. And that, that verse is so profound, it's always stuck with me. Psalm 139.16 says this. It says, and I'll paraphrase it because you you memorize so many different versions sometimes, but it says, every one of my days was recorded in your book, O Lord, before a one of them was ever lived. Stop and think about that for a minute. God, and Jesus Christ is God before all time, the Son of God, the creator of all things, knows every one of our, you know, whatever day I die, And I don't know what day it'll be, of course, or what age it'll be. But God does. God does. Nothing takes God by surprise. Every one of my days. And this didn't take Jesus by surprise. He knew it was time. And his time has come to glorify. So he knows that in the cross, here's here's what's so important. Jesus is praying for himself here. 
That's an interesting concept. Jesus is the God-man, but he's taking a time to pray for himself. He's praying that God, the Father, would glorify him. He's praying uh, since, in verse 2, since you've given me all power over all flesh to give eternal life to whomever uh, it is given. Uh, He's going to, he's going to, he's saying, Father, you've given me the power. This man, Jesus Christ, who is himself God also, this great sacred mystery, God and man. Never forget, whenever we talk about Jesus Christ, we're talking about a sacred mystery. He is fully God and fully man. It's so easy for us to forget that sometimes. Well, we err to the side, oh, well, that's so he could do that because he's God. <laughs> but you see, the great mystery is that he's fully human and fully God. But he laid aside his Godhead, his glory, if you will. He laid aside the glory of the Godhead to be born into this world humbly as a baby and then to grow humbly through human life for 33 years, suffering the exact same temptations, Scripture teaches us, the exact same trials and tribulations and temptations that you and I feel and struggle, yet without sin. Why did he do that? What, what kind of a plan was that? Okay, in the before all eternity, God knew the best way to do this was that I'll divest my son, the part of me of the Godhead, as a baby to be born into the world of humans and to grow up and be mistreated. You don't think kids ever made fun of Jesus when he was little? Guarantee you they did. Jesus suffered all the same tribute. You know, the struggles of growing and thinking that human life, what's my life? We know that gradually, as Jesus grew and matured, he received more and more revelation of what his role was. As this, as this human man, and this, this divinity that was wrapped in himself, this mystery, this holy mystery. I'll tell you, that, that's beautiful to think about. It'll blow your mind the longer you think about it. It's just beautiful. So never use the mistake of saying, oh, Jesus could get away with that because he was God. No, he was fully man just like you and me. And he lived this life without sin, died for us that we might have forgiveness for our sins, then rose from the dead that from a position of glory, the ruler of all the world might send his Holy Spirit so that we could be empowered to what? Live above sin. (laughs) That's our belief. That's our doctrine. We believe that it's possible for Christians by the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit, having consecrated their lives to live above sin may not be practical, may be incredibly difficult to do, may never be done perfectly by us humans, but we have a goal. You see? We have a goal. And the minute we think we've made it to that goal, guess what? You have it. Okay? That's why the holiest people on earth, the holiest people you'll ever meet, the holiest people that have lived through the ages are always people that that saw themselves as very sinful. Isn't that amazing? The few times that Mother Teresa was really interviewed and talked to, I use her as because she's a common, common example in our lifetime of a very saintly person. Uh, Mother Teresa of Calcutta, India, you all know who I mean, the little nun, Catholic nun, who gave her whole life to devote to the ministry in the streets of India to the poor and the dying and the sick. No thought for herself. You read her some of her own writings about her memoirs and some of the interviews, and she saw herself as most sinful. And we look at that and we go, huh? Compared to me? She's a saint. That's why they call her Saint Mother Teresa now. <laughs> what does that mean? What's that about? What, 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 it means that let us never forget that God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is perfect glory. And the, to be holy means to become like him, to become like God. That's what holy means, to be set apart so that we become holier and holier and holier as we strive to become like him. Okay, And I'm going to talk about what that means because it has to do with eternal life in verse 3 in just a minute. 
But remember that if if God is this perfect realm of holiness, the, the Jesus John calls Jesus the light of the world, the uncreated light of the world. Okay, we've talked about that in here too. And the closer you get to that light, the closer you get to it, you realize how different you are from it. We're never going to be God, okay? We're, we're, we're gods with a little g, okay? We're supposed to become gods with a little g, it says in the book of Psalms. Some of the great ages, uh, saints of the ages, Augustine, I think, was the one that said, said uh, Christ became God, became like man, so that man could become like God, meaning to become holy like God. But, but the closer we get, the, the further we are. Does that make sense? If your target, your goal, is infinite, you can never reach it. So the closer we get, the further we are. The more holier we become, the less holy we are, the more work we have to do. It's an, it's an iron, irony, isn't it? It's just something for us to keep in our hearts and our minds so that we stay humble and we don't ever think, wow, I'm getting good at this. I'm getting good at this Christian life. I kind of conquered those sins. I'm really okay. No, no, no. May it never be. May it never be. Let's keep working on it. That's why Jesus in the model prayer teaches us, Father, forgive us our trespasses, which means our sins, as we forgive all who've sinned against us. That's a prayer of confession. We need it every day, all day long. Because there is enough within me that is never going to be the same as the infinite God that I always need to do better. So let's keep that thought in mind. Because what we're striving for is this goal of eternal life. What is the purpose of our faith? Why are you Christians? Why have you chosen to be Christian? If I ask you that question this morning, what would be your answer? You, know, you don't have to share, but if anybody wants to share. So we can go home. So you can go home? Okay. Home meaning? Heaven. Heaven. So that at the end of this journey, you can go home to heaven. Is that what you're saying? Okay. Anybody else? Any thoughts? Why are you Christian? I was born in a Christian family. You were born in a Christian home, in a Christian family. To take others with us. To take others with us. Okay. Would you believe me if I told you while those are all beautiful and all true, there's one that is higher. To be like him. To be like him. And we're going to hear that in this beautiful prayer, but not till we get in a few weeks. I don't want to get ahead of myself. But we're going to hear that. Is, that. is that a cliffhanger? That's a cliffhanger. <laughs> That's a cliffhanger. This prayer mounts like a cliffhanger. It really does. And by the time we get to the end, we're going to have a whole, hopefully, if we're, our hearts are open, we're going to have a whole new perspective on who we are as Christians. And we're going to have a whole new perspective on who we are as a church, an identified people that in this room we call ourselves Nazarenes, Church of the Nazarene. We're going to have a whole new identity in how that connects to the greater Christian world by the time we get to the end. But, but don't get ahead of myself. So look at, we know that Christ is, is uh, Jesus Christ is the ruler of all things. He is God. He is in charge of time. And he says, now is the time. And his prayer, his declaration of the offering is to glorify your son. Father, glorify your son so that the son may glorify you. Well, just how does Jesus believe God is going to give him glory? And he, in turn, gives that glory back to God. Do you know what he's, what is he asking God to do? In so many words, he's asking God to do something that we need to be sure we understand. Father, glorify your son. That your son may glorify you. What is he asking God to do? Is it to making the lamb the sacrificial lamb? Yes. He's saying, give me the strength to follow through. Because the only way glory happens is if I die on that cross. And when I die on that cross, you will have glorified me and I will have glorified you. The cross. And this is why the cross is the glory. Remember the old hymn, I will glory in the cross. I will glory in the cross. Lest his suffering all be in vain. 
I will glory in the cross. I mean, just read that, read that hymn just as a devotional sometime. Just get to open the book and read it. It's just beautiful devotional, those words. The cross is our glory. Why do crosses decorate church buildings? It really grieves me. It really grieves me that there's a movement in modern day Christianity to remove crosses from sanctuary from worship centers, as they want to be called now. Nothing wrong with calling it a worship center. It's what we do there. But, but it grieves me. What, what, what are we trying to say? What are we trying to hide that we believe in the cross? What, what, what are we saying? You know, if I'm gonna, it's okay to have church in a school, but if I'm going to set up church in a school because that's where we have to meet, just like I would under a tree, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to go put a cross in there, under that tree or in that, while we're there, you know? Because what is it's the central focus of our purpose. When you sit in our sanctuary and you look next time at the where is the cross in our sanctuary? I always look up the window. The stained glass, that's right. Right there. Never forget what you're looking at. You're looking at the glory of God. But if you didn't have the cross, then there wouldn't be any. There wouldn't be any hope. There wouldn't be any life. No one gets to God but through the cross of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? We could probably spend weeks on what that means right there. What does it mean? Uh, It's so powerful. The cross is the greatest. Here's why I believe the cross is glory also. Just another reason. The cross is the greatest demonstration of love. That could ever be shown. Some people, non-Christians especially, look at a cross and they see horror. They see pain and ugliness. And they see violence and evil. You serve an evil God to crucify his son like that, to allow that to happen. See, that's the way the world thinks. Because the world's always looking for this victor God who's stronger than everybody else's God. And God says, no, let me show you how strong I am. I'm so strong. I'm the only true God. I'm so strong. I will die myself that you might live. Those are the kind of thoughts that we're working through John Wesley and Charles Wesley. I can't remember which one wrote the hymn. You know, uh, the wondrous cross. You know, uh, you know which hymn I'm talking about. How, how could it be? Or how about the hymn where they wrote, And can it be? And can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? Wow. Not just going to slaughter some cow for you. I'm going to die for you myself. Wow. Because he knows, as the author of life, he has the power to just raise himself back up. All this is to give God the glory. And he's praying in the third person that everyone might know that he is God's son. He is God's son. Now, in verse 3, we find something that is very powerful. It's going to take us a little bit to unpack. Jesus says, you can underline these words because this is pretty important. Jesus says in verse 3, and this is eternal life. Boy, if, if, I could, if, I could, if I could ask that question, like on a test, you know, Describe eternal life for me. And and give it to every single person in church. I I wonder what common theme would run through all of the answers. Let's speculate a little this morning. What do you think? What might be a common theme that would run through all the answers? I know you've read it because we heard it read, so you know what the answer is. Jesus says the answer is to know know you. But, But having not heard that this morning, what might your answer have been? You ask the average person, what's the the purpose? What is it? Describe eternal life. You know what they say? It's living in heaven with God forever and ever. Living in heaven with God. Making it to heaven. That's what they say eternal life is. We're missing something, though. That's just a part of eternal life. Jesus is saying... This is eternal life, that they, now who is the they? Specifically, it's the 12 that he's praying for, that he's interceding for. It's 11, actually, right now. 
But we're going to see as we move through this whole prayer that his view is for everyone who will ever believe and whom he knows will ever believe. But specifically, this is eternal life, that they may know thee, the only true God. And and he doesn't even stop there because it's not enough just to know God the Father. And he says, Jesus Christ, again, talking about himself in the third person, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. He's saying he is the Son of God. He's saying he is sent by God. He's fulfilling everything they ever thought about him. He's teaching them everything they ever thought about him and all the things that he's claimed out there amongst all the Pharisees and people who wondered who he was and never wanted to believe him when he said things. He's claiming it all. And he's saying here is eternal life. Eternal life is knowing God. What does it mean to know God? We need to unpack that a little bit here. What does it mean to know God? You have to study the word. You have to study the word. Well, that's certainly a help. But what about the people that, like these these, these apostles didn't even have the word to study. Yeah. What about them? How did they know God? Through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ. He made God real to them. Mm-hmm. I want to unpack the word to know. That's a verb, okay? To know. All through the Bible, when, when we, I, I, did I write that in my notes? I may not have written it in my notes, the, the Greek word here for, for the verb to know. Yeah, I did. It comes from ginoso, ginosko, G-I-N-O-S-K-O, okay? G-I-N-O-S-K-O, ginosko. This is the verb to know. Now, if you give me a test, and I may, okay, how many books of the Bible do you, can you name, Brad? And, and I, you give me a test, and I, let's say I get them all right, or I get close, you know. The, the, that demonstrates some knowledge, right? Uh, some knowledge, okay? When we go through school, why do they give us tests of any kind? Kind of demonstrates our knowledge, right? You've got to demonstrate that we've actually learned something. But that's not what this word means in the Greek, The connotation of this word isn't to know something intellectually. The connotation of the word is to know something experientially. And we can even say intimately. Okay? And the same is in the Hebrew word. When we go back into the Hebrew, the etymology of the Hebrew words of the Old Testament. When it said, you can go all the way back to Adam and Eve. And when Adam knew Eve, it meant he knew her intimately. And we see the the sexual intimacy that brings in the procreative act of God into creation. That that is the word. And it follows through into the New Testament. This very word, to know God intimately. Jesus isn't concerned that they memorize who God is. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit memorize the books of the Bible and memorize this. He's not concerned. He's concerned that they get to truly, intimately, personally know God. So I ask you this morning, do you know God or do you know about God? Because there's a whole lot of people in the world that know about God. In fact, it's pretty hard to find anyone that doesn't know about God. But it's getting harder and harder to find people that really intimately, experientially know God. And it is in that knowledge right there, that intimate experiential knowledge of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that we are saved. That we are saved. Because we have eternal life. I'm going to take you back to John chapter 5 again. I always do this. I always go back to John 5, 24, don't I? What did John 5, 24 say? Jesus said, everyone who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death and into life. Knowing God is eternal life. Not knowing about him, 
knowing him. That's why it's accurate for us to say that salvation is a personal experience with God, not a personal decision. Too often evangelicalism has concentrated on the word decision, made a decision for Christ. Well, guess what? You can make a decision for Christ and really not feel it in your heart. It's just a decision you made, but it didn't transform you. I think that, that word, that wording, while it's not inaccurate, it's not full. We need more than a decision for Christ. We need an experience of Jesus Christ. Now, knowing that we need an experience of Jesus Christ, when you open, like it was said here earlier by someone, to, to read his word, to study his word. Now, when you open the word of God, the Bible, as we know it, the Holy Scriptures, and you begin to read it, think in terms of experiencing the word. Why did we pray the prayer? I became convicted that we should pray before we study. When I learned this prayer, this prayer goes back to the 4th century. Now, I anglicized it a little bit, you know, for English and contemporary language a little bit. This prayer, I didn't know where it came from when I first heard it. I just liked it. And I thought, wow, that really says a lot. And and it actually goes back to the 4th century uh, Archbishop of Constantinople, the Patriarch of Constantinople, whose name was... Uh, John Chrysostom, born and raised in Antioch, he prayed this prayer. It's, it's attributed to him. And what does it ask us to do? Illumine, before you study the God's word, illumine our hearts, master the lover of all humanity, with the pure light of your divine knowledge. There's that word again, of, the, of your divine experience, Okay. And then open the eyes of our heart. Not, the, not, not open our minds. This prayer doesn't say open our minds. It says open the eyes of our hearts. Because it's through the heart that we experience things, that we truly know things. Okay. So I, I won't go through the whole prayer with you. This is in the class about dissecting that prayer. Because we pray it every week. Hopefully you think about it. But the point is, when you read the word of God, read it with experience in your heart. Allow the Holy Spirit to come alive and bring Christ living, the crucified and resurrected and glorified Christ to life as you read it. When you come to worship and we begin to sing and you begin to hear the music, think about the words and experience those words. It'll change your life. When the pastor gets up to pray or to preach and teach, open your heart eyes of your heart, not just your mind, and allow them to soak in and experience the word. I'm speaking of something kind of mystical, aren't I? Because you know what? To be a Christian is mystical. Because God is mystical. We, we must shake off the, the thought that Christianity is all about a set of rules and a set of beliefs And and a set of doctrines that if we just live up to them, we're Christian. No. To be Christian is to experience, know God. That's powerful. Uh, Powerful to me. Hope is powerful to you. So, Jesus Christ says, eternal, this is eternal, that they know the only true God, Jesus Christ, in whom they are sent. Verse 4. I glorified thee on earth, having accomplished the work which thou gavest me to do. Jesus Christ is saying, I gave you glory by being obedient to all the work that you gave me to do. Jesus never said, oh no, Father, I don't want to do that. I was obedient all the way. And he's about to prove that as he sweats drops of blood in the garden. In in a very human prayer that says, Father, if if it could be your will, take this cup from me. In other words, let this cross, is there any other way? But finally, it's no, not my will, but your will. And so he says in verse 5, And now, Father, glorify thou me. In other words, you glorify me. Here we hear Jesus in the first person <coughs> praying for himself. It's, it's been second, per, I mean third person, right? And now look what he says in, this, in verses 4 and 5, Which thou gave to me to do, and now glorify you, You glorify me in your own presence. In your own presence with the glory which I had with thee before the world was made. 
this is incredible teaching. Jesus Christ is admitting right here as he prays and knowing that they're listening. He's praying in the room with them, okay? He's saying, I existed before the world ever began. I am the preexistent one. Remember what John said in the beginning of this gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. Jesus is saying, I, and he's saying, Father, give me that glory now. And the Father's going to do it in about uh, 40 days. <laughs> he's going to do it in about three days by resurrecting him from the dead, and then finally in the full 40 days by taking him back to the very throne of God in heaven to reign Forever and ever, King of kings and Lord of lords. Hallelujah, right? The hallelujah chorus. So, give me that glory, Father, Jesus says. He says, give me your own presence. You see, the true glory of God, the true glory of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is his presence. There is a song that we used to sing. It's about 20 years old now. It's one of those worship songs. It's probably in the range of 20 years old. I don't know when it was written. Um, But it went something like this. It said, the chorus said, Knowing you, Jesus, knowing you, there is no greater thing. Do you remember it? Knowing you, Jesus, knowing you, There is no greater thing. You're my all. You're the best. You're my joy, my righteousness. And I love you, Lord. You get the essence of what this prayer is. Knowing you, Jesus. Not just believing in you. Even that demons believe, James tells us. But knowing you, Jesus. Knowing you, Father, knowing you, Holy Spirit, is the greatest thing because it is eternal life. That's transforming. That's just the first five verses of this prayer. But he started with the glory. He started with giving God glory very humbly, talking about himself in the third person. He talks about... um, explaining to them what eternal life really means. And then he ends these five, this section of it by saying, give me that glory, Father. This is why I was, this is why I'm here. This is why I, the same glory that I had with you before the world began. Well, that's a lot. That's just five verses, but that's a lot. Um, I missed something in my notes here. I was going to tell you about knowing God. Do you remember the, you remember the story of, uh, remember the story of Mary, Jesus' mother, in Luke chapter one, when the angel told her that she had been chosen, and she says, "How is this possible? I have not known a man." There's that word again. It's the same exact word used right here. This ginosko. It's a form of the. The, the noun uh, gnosis, which means knowledge or knowing. Mary, you, you see, and what was Mary trying to say? She was a virgin. She'd never known a man. If there's that experiential. I, I had that in my notes. I forgot to bring it out. That's what happens when I start going, get, getting on a roll and I don't look at my notes. Um, I think I covered everything else. There's a lot more I wanted to say here. Uh, let me give you these closing thoughts. The cross was going to be Jesus' greatest Accomplishment on earth. He willingly laid down his life. He was despised, as Isaiah said, despised of men. He went to the cross willingly. And, you know, it's interesting that it it took Jesus' death to bring about faith in some people. And we can say, well, it took his resurrection, yes. but, But do you remember what happened at the foot of the cross? When Jesus died, he said, it is finished. And do you remember there was this great, the skies had become dark and there was this great thunder and there was this, this clap and we know that there was a great earthquake, scripture tells us, and we know that the curtain was torn in two in the temple. Remember how that happened? And do you remember what happened there at the foot of the cross? What somebody said? There was a Roman soldier, 
A Roman centurion, he said what? Surely this is the Christ. Surely this is the Son of God. Took his death to believe. Because who dies that way? Who dies lovely? Who forgive? Father, forgive them. This guy had heard him say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I mean, who dies that way? It's amazing. And history is full of people that have died and it took their death for people to really realize how great they were. Isn't that often the case? It is, isn't it? The story of Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln, admittedly one of our, by everyone, one of our greatest presidents, if not the greatest. When he was shot and died, his secretary of war, who was a man by the last name of Stanton, Secretary Stanton, was an opponent of Abraham throughout their whole <laughs> career together. He, he disagreed with Abraham Lincoln on almost everything, but he was quoted as saying this, when, when, when he was there and observing the death of the president, he said this. He said, there lies the greatest ruler of men the world has ever known. It took his death for him to say that. Remember, this, remember the story of Joan of Arc? You ever study the st- story of Joan of Arc? Well, that's a fascinating story. Go study it sometime. What a fascinating story of this 18-year-old young virgin woman in France, and France is embroiled with war with England. England was actually ruling France. It's called the Hundred Years' War, and you know, and she's wanting to fight for her country. She's had visions. She says she had visions of, of um, Michael the Archangel and uh, St. Margaret, and she had three visions. I forget who the other one was. And they all led her to, to go to the king and say, I want a battle for France, you know, and like, who, who puts an 18-year-old girl in charge of your army? It just doesn't happen, right? And, and peasant girl. And, and you know, the, France is about to lose. There, It's a horrible story. And and they do it. In last-ditch effort, they put her in charge. And she leads a rebellion in, in a sense. History says that she never actually killed anyone. She just held up her banner. And that banner was the banner to represent her faith. She was a devout virgin dedicated to Jesus Christ and she held that banner up as her faith and she inspired the people and they began to win well it turns out in one of their little uh, things she was actually captured by the the French were split in two and there were some French factions that were aligned with the English and she was captured and do you know that it was I wrote it down 589 years ago today she was captured May 23rd May 23rd Joan of Arc was captured And a year and seven days later, she was burned at the stake because the English bishop that was put in charge of her trial accused her of all kinds of things that were ridiculous. They tied her up and they burned her at the stake. And one of the secretaries to the king of England watched her die. I mean, she said beautiful things from the the flames. She was um, amazingly Christ-like in her death. And this one secretary of the king said, I think his word, exact words, I wrote it down, we are all lost because we have burned a saint. I mean, he's one minute calling for her death. And then after she dies, he says, oh, no, we're all lost. We've burned a saint. I mean, it, it takes death. Well, it did for Jesus as well. It took his death for some people to see who he really was. And in a little while, they're going to see his resurrection. And wow. Well, I've gone over. My goodness, it's 10 after. Sorry about that. Thank you for your time. Next week, let's be prepared to look at the second section. We'll talk about how Jesus is praying for the faith of his his disciples. Let's uh, close with prayer. Father, thank you for time together to study your word. We pray that you would just uh, just cover over anything that I've said that's wrong, not to have anyone misled, but but that you would truly inhabit our prayers and our praise and our study and help us to see the light of Jesus Christ more fully, to know you, the one true God. Through Jesus Christ whom you have sent, in the power of the Holy Spirit, whom you've given, and that through this triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we give you all glory. Pray this now. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now and forever. Amen.
changes of nature and that glory be extended to you. This has been Forming the Spirit Within. I'm Roger Culver, inviting you to tune in next time as Pastor Brad opens God's Word, helping us to form the Holy Spirit within us. Until then, may grace and peace be with you.